Okay, welcome to the very first episode of Status Check, the customer onboarding and customer success podcast. Uh, I'm Dave, co-founder of Status, customer onboarding software. Today, we're here with Greg Danes, CEO of Churn RX, and we'll get into that a little bit. We're going to start off with a segment, get you value right away, and do a little something I like to call press the guest right away. Greg, you've been around customer success teams for many years. What's the biggest misconception that you see about customer success right now? Ooh, good one. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's interesting because we have a set of instincts that we've inherited, which they're they're not wrong. They're just very difficult to uh, extract value from. So the, the 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 instincts sort of come down through the ages from the from the I would say transactional world of selling. And, and one of those instincts is the customer's always right, mm. right? That the, the, it's not our place to say, you know, how the customer gets value or what, what matters to them. And that instinct is founded on a really good, I think, great idea. The problem is that it, it ends up being essentially an, enough of an of a obstacle as to be an, a misconception simply because that instinct leads us to stay out of areas and 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 not in, in uh, get involved in things that are critical for customers to really get value and get success. Sure. So um, so sometimes we have to actually take a, a little bit of a contrary view. We have to say, what if the customer's not right? What can we do to mm -hmm. add value to the customer's current understanding of how to win? And so I think that's a that's a good example of one. Yeah, that's a great misconception, and we can we can dive into that a little bit as we go throughout the show. Uh, so again, I'm Dave, co-founder here of Status, here with Greg Danes. So we got to know Greg, and, and what we really enjoyed about Greg is uh, a unique approach that goes above, you know, the or, or deeper than the generalities of customer success, and not afraid to dive into the data. Um, Greg, you've met with our team a couple times. Really like your data-driven approach, your experienced, uh, you know, leadership in this space, and so that's how we kind of got to know Greg, and thought he'd be uh, an excellent value add to customer success, customer onboarding, customer implementation, post-sale leaders in general out there who are looking to kind of make 2023 a better year uh, as far as customer success goes. Um, Greg, let me give you the floor real quick. Can tell us a little bit about uh, who you are, what ChurnRx is, and kind of how you got to where you are in the customer success space. Okay. Well, the quick version is uh, I started out as a serial entrepreneur, started companies, all SaaS, all B2B. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, like everyone else didn't really know what I was doing, discovered there's a lot of hard things about doing this, right? Creating companies, you know. Yeah. But every, out of all the things that w were difficult, you know, designing a product, entering a market, raising money, building a company, I mean, the one thing that I found that was the most difficult thing to do was to consistently make my customers successful at scale. And, and, and I had this experience over and over again where I'd sort of, uh, face a problem customer related and I'd go out and see what the smart people were saying about it. Best practices, bring them back and they wouldn't work. And this happened over and over and over again. It drove me crazy kind of because, you know, why, why is that the case? Why don't things that, that everybody says, why don't they work? And, and so I spent a lot of time kind of scratching my head about that and, and sort of over time, because I'm a little bit slow, came to to understand that there are several of these big sort of um, accepted ideas that are just wrong. Yeah. And it was only in the the course of kind of confronting those that I really came to fall in love with it. Like I find this, you know, one way to think about what's interesting is, well, what's the hardest thing? That's usually the most interesting thing. That's the sure. thing you can really, and I, I just decided that's what I want to do. I want to, I'm going to focus in on this and, and, and crack this nut, unpack why is it so difficult to consistently make customers successful? You know, cause one will come in and just take it on and, and be incredibly successful and do great yeah. things and brag about you. And the next one looks almost the same. And they really don't like they kind of go sideways and eventually churn out. And that drove me crazy. So, so that's my background from being a serial entrepreneur to sort of deciding to focus in on this. And now, uh, you know, churn RX is short version as we do churn consulting, churn analytics and churn training and, and anything churn, right? We just want to yeah. 
figure out what's going on with customer attention because that's really what's at the heart of success now in sure. business growth everything is about how do you retain customers sure so we love it yeah love that and, and maybe before we dive into kind of the the depth of some of these topics um knowing churn i've heard you say even before the customer gets to a customer success leader or a customer success team the number one thing you can do to stop churn is actually sell to the right people. Um, tell me about your experience and how you've empowered customer success teams to better partner with product or sales so that they end up actually selling to the right groups that are you know, going to stick with your business. Right. Well, so I, in every case, right, when you're talking about marketing or sales or product, you have people whose instinct is right, which is, you know, this is for who this is for. It's for who, uh, you know, we can make the most successful, mm -hmm. right? Now, we do sometimes get off track a little bit. We do sort of sort of get pulled back into that more traditional transactional mindset of, well, it's for whoever I will buy it. Yeah. Mm, that's not quite right. It's those who buy it should be the ones we can make the most money, right? That's our ideal customer profile. And what I love about marketing, right, just as an example is, they just have in their DNA, marketing knows that you sell benefits, not features, right? That you sell the, 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 the outcome, the, the win, right? Rather than the components. But the challenge they have, and this is not just limited to marketing, but it's a great example. The challenge they have is, but what are those benefits, right? Now, the, the, when you create a company, you know, you, you, you built the product, you, you're sure you know, like if anyone knows, it's me, I know what it's for, I know what the benefits are. But time and time again, we face the most interesting situation, which is, well, we'll go in, we'll ask a leadership team to, you know, comprehensively define what are the key benefits? What, you know, what's the win? Why, why do customers uh, want this? Like, what's the outcome, right? And they'll say what it is. And then we'll go study customers, successful customers in mm -hmm. particular. And what we'll see back in terms of insight is, Sort of, but not exactly. And in fact, in many cases, the critical wins, the critical results and, and outcomes that, that customers are really staying for aren't exactly the way we thought about it. And there's so sure. much insight to talk about the product team. They kind of get that. Again, kind of mm -hmm. wired into their DNA is we should watch. Right? They have this instinct. Like, we should watch and see what people do. That's a great instinct. But their tools are limited right? Because what do they have? They have one lens and that is what people are doing inside the software, inside the system or the solution. And that's great, by the way. Uh, n n n no disrespect to that as an incredibly useful feedback mm -hmm. uh, avenue. But, but that's actually the, not the whole story. What, what we're talking about here is what's the big win for them? In the case of my world, it's always been business to business. So I'll talk about that. But you know, what's, what's the business benefit? What's the business objective that's coming out of this is not the same as uh, something that you can discern entirely watching how they use the system. You can get a bunch of insight, but even most good product managers know that's not the whole story. And so one of the things that's really powerful is to get feedback up the chain from, from the way customers onboard and, and then use and then adapt their business around and then benefit that set of insights is incredibly mm -hmm. powerful feeding that back up into marketing and sales and products really powerful yeah love that so it, it it is okay to say that just because we can sell it to them doesn't mean we should absolutely so the 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 simple instinct on that is what's the intuition um can you think of a customer you've ever had at any company mm -hmm. who shouldn't have bought Oh, absolutely. Okay. Right. Yeah. And you're watching someone fail. And this isn't every time, but sometimes you watch a customer fail and you think they couldn't have won. They actually weren't in a position to get the benefit, right, that we produce. And there's lots of reasons for that. But just because a customer fails doesn't mean they were a bad fit. But there are some customers who couldn't win. And that's a distinction that I like to make, right? You could have won, but you didn't. That's not a bad fit. That's the, we got to look some other places for that. But if they literally can't get the benefit or, or don't have, you know, all the necessary components or whatever, that's a bad fit. We shouldn't sell to them. And so one of the things that we need to do, and, and it's actually one of the biggest contributors to churn generally, we have a lot of data on this, very interesting, is selling to the wrong customers. Yeah. Now those those elements of, of fit can be subtle and we do need to unpack them and be really careful to be clear. 
what exactly does it take to win, <laughs> right? And then, well, we don't want to go further than that, start blaming a lot of failure that we have on that. But if we're clear about that, that can really help us tune in to, you know, who's our bullseye customer? You know, what's a good sale? What's a not good sale, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great advice. Focus in on, on who truly has measurable results. Yep, we love that. Uh, love to hear that as well. So this, obviously, our focus uh, from our company being customer implementations, customer onboarding, a critical moment in the customer journey. You've done a lot of uh, deep dives into the data here. Uh, this is now an area of the post-sale lifecycle that is getting a lot of attention. Why are you seeing that that's the case with the folks you're working with, with the data that you are you know, kind of extracting from this process? I love that this has become a theme recently because it's so important. So there's a couple of things to step into this to see why it's so important. Why is onboarding or early, whatever you want to call that earliest phase of yeah. engagement, so important? Well, one of the reasons we know it's important is that uh, one of the things our research has revealed is that churn isn't linear. Okay, so what that just means is that, uh, you know, you bring in a bunch of new customers, whatever number there are, and they don't just line up in an orderly fashion and, and let themselves out the door, right? One at a time. What happens is for the vast majority of companies and not all, and by the way, as a side note, this is why it's so important to know what kind of churn you have, but the majority of SaaS companies have a kind of churn we call decelerating churn, which is really simple. It just means that most customers who are going to churn will do so early. So you get this kind of quick drop off in customers and then it slows down and slows down and, until it kind of flattens out. And what that means is that there was a group of customers that were not a fit or that were not going to get successful and they tend to know early. Yeah. And, and as you burn through those, what you're ending up with are the customers who are a good fit and who are getting good results. So one of the reasons we know that the early phase is so important is it's actually where most of the churn happens for most companies. Okay. That's one reason. And, and it's quite interesting, too, because just that fact has a really important implication in terms of what your customer lifespan is. So we, we know customer lifespan is the average life, and usually we calculate it in months, yeah. of a customer. Right? How long do they stay? Now, there's really two things that could affect that average, right? The first one is the one most people instinctively think about, which is how do I make a customer stay an extra month or 10 months or 20 months or whatever? So you're thinking about adding life onto the end of their life. But if most customers who churn, churn early, relatively, then actually the other leverage point is the much more important one, which is how do I keep customers from leaving quickly? Yes. Like how do I extend you know, th that, that early lifespan. Yep. And that's a completely different sort of uh, way of thinking. There is a metaphor for this, which is really, or an analog for this actually, which is really interesting, which is, uh, you know, the study of human lifespans, right? And we yeah. know that over the last, I don't know, 100 years or so, human lifespans went up massively, right? Yeah. From, from, I don't know, in the 30s or 40s to way up into the 70s in some cases. I think Japan was like 80 years old, right? Average lifespan. What people naturally think is that what's happening is we're, we're figuring out how to make old people live even longer. But actually, nearly all of that transformation from, you know, a, a, what I think was nearly a doubling or more of human lifespans didn't come from helping old people live to an older age. Actually, the majority of it came from reducing infant mortality. Mm. So, what, what you realize is that they have the, you have the same curve, or at least you did 100 years ago, where right. most people who were going to die uh, early, shall we say, do so in the very first you know, days, minutes, weeks of life. And, and that what that's doing is that's actually distorting downward the average lifespan. If you made, in, in essence, if you made it to the age of five, you, 100 years ago, you were as likely as now to make it to 75. Yeah. Does that make sense? Sure. So what we do with customers, same thing. What we do is we look at, well, look, all of the death is early. All of the, all of the cancellation and the churn is, or most of it is happening early. We should be looking early. So that's one way in which we step into it. And just from the data, you know, we, we see, um, you know, 80 to 85% of all churn happens within the first 90 days. So it's, wow. it's just the overwhelming opportunity. Now that doesn't say why mm -hmm. that just says where, 
Okay, yeah. but at least knowing where that really shifts our focus. Yeah. It means that even if you have no theory as to why, which we do, I'll get to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. We know that onboarding is the critical moment, okay. right? Whatever's happening, it's happening there. Yeah. The other side to this is to see an even more interesting reality, which is that customers who churn later are almost invariably churning for things that started early. In other words, they the causes were early. Yep, they made their decision a long time ago. Right. Yep. So um, classic situation, you talk to a CSM, why did that big important customer churn? Well, I mean, I knew they were gonna churn almost from the first moment. Yep. Wait, well, how, how did you know that? Well, they never had support from leadership and they never got their ducks in an order and they never could integrate with this other. I mean, it, it's like, well, but if we knew that, why, why are we still out here thinking we're going to extend the life when all the, the mistakes were early, right? The classic zombie customer. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. And, and everyone just kind of knows they're going to churn. They're just hoping it, you know, not this week or not this month or not this mm -hmm. quarter or whatever. But, but we, so the other the, kind of the classic test on this is, is um, and I ask CSMs like this or account managers like this all the time, have you ever gotten off a first call with a customer? And turn to your neighbor or to yourself or to your dog or whatever and said, they're not going to make it. Mm. And everybody says, oh, yeah, yeah. It yeah. happens all the time. Yeah. Why, though? How do we know? How You just spoke to them for the first time. How's mm -hmm. it By the way, you're right, actually. You're almost invariably right. The question is, how do you know? And the answer is because the causes of failure are almost all visible right from the start. Mm. So I mentioned things like, you know, lack of leadership support or some key technical problem like a lack of an integration or they don't put the resources into it or mm -hmm. the wrong people showed up to the meeting so that it doesn't look like they're serious. Well, those are all really good signals, right? That something's wrong. So, th so there's really two issues here. One is all, all of the failures early and the causes of all the failure, regardless of whether it's early or late are early. Mm -hmm. So it's all early. Like everything's yeah. about that. Yeah. And the more we focused in on that, the more we could see, all of the elements that give you the most leverage to reduce churn happen in the first weeks of the of the customer lifespan. Super high leverage opportunity. Yep. Uh, yeah, obviously, that's why we're building in this space. One thing I want to ask for the heads of onboarding, for the directors of implementation out there, typically in a B2B space, uh, often there is this declarative moment of onboarding or implementation is done. Now it's with the account manager. Now it's with the CSM. You've sat with a number of these companies, these teams. How do you know when an onboarding or an implementation project is successful? What are those indicators? Well, it's such a great question. And you've answered your question by the way you asked it, but I'm going to come back to it because sure. the hint is in the way you ask the question. Because actually, when I was running it <clears throat> multiple times, one of the hardest things I struggled with was how to know when it's done. Mm -hmm. A lot of times customers don't want it to be done. They build a relationship. They also, with the person who's doing the onboarding, or they sense that a bunch of resources are available to them now that won't be after they get transitioned. So there's resistance sometimes from them. We sometimes have resistance because we can see that we didn't quite get them far enough down the path that they really can do it on their own or something like that. Those are really common instincts and they're right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's this sense of, well, okay, one way you could test is we had a list of tasks and we did them all. We got to the end of the list. Okay, but do those tasks, what's the relationship between that set of tasks and the customer being able to be successful. Sure. Okay. Um, another way is to say, well, you get 90 days. And when the 90 days is up, if you didn't use it well, you know, no matter what, you. you're moving on. Right. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I don't even have to defend that one. Mm -hmm. um, so it is actually a problem. And I struggled with it for a long time. What's, what is the definitive moment, right? When you can say, uh, this is ready to move on, right? Now, it has to have some kind of time limit. It's Im impractical for, for there not to be any kind of sense of how long that could take. It can't be infinitely elastic, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there should be some list of tasks because <laughs> there's you know work to do, obviously. Right. So I think the key was in the way you asked it because you said, how do you know when the customer has been successful? Because that's actually the, the critical thing. So the, the most important metric, in my opinion – for the sort of um, early life of a customer, which I've just made the case is the most important time in the customer. So you could say this is the most important metric there is in, mm -hmm. in customer success is 
first results, time to first results. Now, you could say, well, it's just when we get to the, that first measurable result. And that is a really important piece of it. But the time element matters too. Because the truth is, customers are doing something new that requires effort. Mm -hmm. um, very few applications that matter require zero effort. You can just turn them on and everyone uses them. I like to use Slack as a good example. Yeah. But there aren't that many like that. Most of us, were, they're trying to do a new business process. They're trying to achieve something new. And, 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 and so that effort is a tax on the relationship. And the longer you go with them just hoping for results, the more you drain that, that yeah. well of, of willingness and, and enthusiasm. And it can get to the point where there just isn't any left and they still haven't gotten there. Mm -hmm. So it is very important not only to get customers to their first measurable results, but to do so as quickly with as few obstacles and stops along the way sure. as possible and and more advanced opportunities for them to do more that's great because mm -hmm. what our data shows and this is very interesting the best predictor by far of long-term customer retention is measurable results any measurable results but what's interesting is and 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 it's quite clear that the more results you get the longer you stay actually it's pretty nicely correlated but the biggest win is the first results any results Right, So we had a client that figured out how to compress their onboarding into from what was, I don't know, 37 steps or something down to like four. Sure. And the goal here wasn't to do everything they used to do. The goal was to do everything you need to do to get the first dollar of revenue coming mm. in. And you think, well, nobody signed up to, to get one dollar of revenue. No, but, but please don't misunderstand the significance of that yeah. because that's an indication that it was all worth it and that they should keep investing their time and effort into doing it. So time to first results, really important. If you can build an onboarding, right, that can get them to that first result, then you have other questions. And I think they're legitimate questions I can't answer in, in a generic yeah. way. But uh, what I like to do as a general principle is say, that's onboarding. Sure. But on the other hand, I feel like there are elements of onboarding that should sort of be ongoing. Yeah. Like I, I like I like it when people say something which isn't exactly true, but I think is directionally right, which is onboarding done right never ends. Uh, there's a sense of the formal phase is to get you to first, you know, measurable results and to build that momentum. But we should also be thinking about things we do post onboarding in a kind of onboarding way, like how do we teach them the next value point? Yeah. How do we deliver that value? If you spread that over the life of the next year or two of that customer relationship, you can accomplish just phenomenal things. That's uh, some really great points there. Uh, I wanted to double double click down into one of those. Uh, what if? How would you advise a team if their onboarding is a little bit more of an enterprise grade project? It's three, four, five months. Sure, you might be able to get them to some sort of first result in that first few weeks, but it's hard often to maybe put those stage gates up, those different milestones of maintaining that momentum how can teams maintain that momentum when you know figuratively and literally the platform might not be ready for six months for five months common situation and it was the dominant situation in my own uh companies we were doing very complex mm -hmm. integrations and and customizations to configure out a, a, an application six months was a typical or, or a year and i found that there are two sort of dynamics going on that you that you got to pay attention to the first is the engagement of your sponsor okay because one of the things that happens as it drags on and and actually it happens relatively quickly is that that sponsor will do what they call a handoff but i call a hand down yeah <laughs> right i say there's no such thing as a handoff there's only such thing as a hand down because what they're doing is they're saying okay great we believe in you this is great i've got my person i'm gonna hand it off I've got 99 other problems. I'm going to go think about that. Call me when it's ready. That's really bad. That's a very bad dynamic because, and everybody knows why, but just to, just to, you know, get it clear, it's really difficult to re-engage that person. Yeah. They think they will, yeah. but then it's hard. You get the dreaded email. Hey, what's the status? What's going on? Yep. What phase are we in? Yep. And invariably, if they are getting any, you know, communication about it, it can be that it's negative from their own people saying, oh, this was harder and took longer. And, you know, it didn't sound, it didn't turn out quite as good as the yeah. way they made it sound, whatever. Well, the problem with that is that the people you're working with uh, on the daily basis have a different set of motivations than that leader, right? That leader bought it 
for some business benefit, mm-hmm. right? We're going to grow or we're going to save money. Or we're going to go faster, or whatever. I mean, whatever the thing is, right? Um, but the person they hand it down to has a different job. Their job is to get the project done. They've got 99 other projects. This one can't, you know, overwhelm their life. And they're literally not looking at it from a business benefit standpoint, even if they say they are. That's not really their fundamental yeah. motivation. So in order to maintain sponsor engagement, I, I, I came up with a trick. And I, and I actually, maybe I don't think it's a trick. I actually think it's a, it's a legitimate um, re- structuring of the way we engage with our customers. And so what I would do is uh, invariably in a, in a build out that long, you're building a bunch of tech and you're integrating stuff and you're filling with data and you're doing all that kind of stuff. But one of the things that you're going to do eventually is light up a report or some indication that shows if it's working. Right. And our normal pathways to do that last, what makes sense. You, you can't measure how well it's working until it's working Yeah, and you can't, measure how well it's working until there's data. And so it's kind of the last thing. So in the meantime, don't report on anything. Yeah, not there's done. nothing to report. There's nothing yep. to see. So what I would do is I'd say, you know what I want to do? I want to flip that. Build the metrics reports first and then do the rest of the system. My people would frequently say, that makes no sense. There'll be nothing to see in those reports. I know, but I am solving for another problem, which is that this sponsor, their only interest is mm-hmm. what's eventually going to show up on those reports. So they're going to be drawn back in. So in the meantime, I have something to show them. And basically, I'll be very clear. Look, these are not going to be lit with data first, but I want to show you how they're going to look. Yeah. We can, I can train you as to what they'll mean. That continual kind of re-engagement on a more regular cadence over the period of build keeps their interest it it also is an opportunity to train them as to what will matter. So at the end, instead of thinking what matters is this negative feedback coming from the project team, but the real factor is when is it going to produce the result yeah. we paid for? Yeah. And that's a really powerful way to keep that momentum going. Now, does it work forever? No, nothing works forever. That's why it's so important to figure out how to compress. So then the other technique is can we compartmentalize or break up the project into – pieces that each one of them has a little bit of a deliverable or a little bit of a measurable results moment of its own. And that might be not nearly the end business result, like we made more money or we saved more money, but it might be some proxy of an indication that that's where we're going and that it is working so far. So those are kind of the two main techniques. Okay. Really love that. Engage the sponsor, keep it simple, draw them in with uh, measurable results or what measurable measurable mm-hmm. results will look like mm-hmm. eventually. Yep. Greg, you, you've done some really interesting uh, surveying and uh, brought some really interesting data of customer success to light recently. I'd love to cover some of that. And in the show notes, we can link to kind of some of your findings. Um, so one, one of those first, uh, I guess, as you've, as you've gathered this data, as you've gathered these surveys, what are some surprising results that you've seen from these surveys that are a little bit maybe contrarian or uh, that aren't you know necessarily obvious to customer success leaders? Great question. Well, I love when we find stuff like that, uh, uh, particularly if it's uh, robust and at scale, because you know, I mean, part of being in the customer success world is the constant mystery of why things, like I said before, don't always happen the same way. I mean. Fundamentally, the most interesting thing about that that experience to me was just the reality that we give the same software and we give the same services and we give the same everything to all our customers, but they don't get anywhere near the same results. They get anywhere from nothing to incredible and everything in between. That variability has to mean that there's a lot going on on the customer side. It's not just about us, right? So we study a lot of those things. Here's one of them. One of the, maybe the most contradictory thing that we found that shocks people is that the the one thing we think is the best predictor of customer retention is customer satisfaction, mm-hmm. right? But what we found, and yeah, you can link to this, there's great data on this, is that in fact, that's not the case at all. And, and, and uh, quite the contrary. So we studied NPS data, which is great because sort of everybody's jumped on this NPS bag and wagon is the best, most common, most universal customer sat, you know, mm-hmm. tool. And, you know, it's a scale from zero to 10. And what you'd expect is customers who say this is a zero, this is the worst vendor we've ever worked with wouldn't stay very long. And customers say this is the best vendor we ever worked with. They would stay longer. And actually it turns out there's zero correlation between 
the 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 satisfaction cor- uh, c- customers report and their uh, longevity, their their lifespan. What is going on there? That's just a shocking result, right? And by the way, it's extremely consistent. It's not just NPS. Every SAT score uh, method that we've ever tested, same result. We are not the only ones who have found it. Great company called CEB. They're the ones who did the challenger sale. Sure. They found the same thing. In fact, in their data, it was actually with consumer. We've only done B2B. Yeah. What a fascinating contradiction with our virtually universally held belief system around business that the customers who are satisfied are the ones who stay. Actually not true. Customer so happiness a, doesn't pay. It doesn't pay. Yeah. It doesn't work. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't make right. our customers happy. Of, of course we should. And shame on us if we don't. It Absolutely. just means it's not going to have any impact on our long-term retention. We've got to look elsewhere for that. So that's a good one. That is that is uh, <laughs> very interesting. And it, 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 you know, anecdotally, sometimes those customers who care the most are the ones that are talking to you the most, who are bringing up the most bugs, who are requesting the most features, who you might be nervous about churning out. But in fact, you can tell that they're invested. They may not be totally happy and satisfied, but the fact that they care is showing up in other areas. Totally right. In fact, so that one shows up in the satisfaction data Mm -hmm. because of course, when you run a satisfaction survey, not all your customers respond. Right. Response rates are typically 10 or 15%. 15 is what we see in our data. Well, what about the customers who didn't respond? Did they have a, a similar lifespan to the ones who did? And the answer is no, actually. Their lifespan was significantly shorter, less than half. Well, wait, so what? Is there a signal or is there not? Yes, there's a signal. It just has nothing to do with how happy you are. It has to do with how engaged you are. Yeah. So the people who are engaged enough to say either we love you or we hate you were very likely to stay. Yeah. If they were disengaged, they were very likely to leave. We see a similar situation in another data point, <clears throat> pardon me, which is uh, customer ticket data. Okay. Okay. So we took customer ticket data and we strip out all the tickets that aren't really negative, right? Like, reset my password or answer a question problems i run into a problem i'm frustrated whatever we just we pull that ticket data and we divide the customers into two groups customers who've never had one of those negative experiences and customers who have one or more Mm -hmm. well naturally you would assume customers without negative experiences ought to stay on average at least a little longer but it's just the opposite. In fact, customers who've never had a negative experience stay less than half as long as customers who have had negative experiences. Wow. What's that about, right? That seems very contradictory to the intuition. Well, uh, the, the insight came from Sun Microsystems, a company way back in the 90s, who did the same thing. And of course, they were trying to solve for all these problems and only noticed tangentially that this relationship existed where the customers with negative experiences did much better. Well, it all comes back to customer results, right? So fundamentally, customers who get results are the ones who stay, right? And well, what's that about? That involves almost entirely behavior change, right? So why do some customers get results and others don't? The answer is customers who get results are the ones who change how they work to take advantage of the way the system produces benefits. Right. Well, that changing how you work means engaging with the technology, maybe with the with the expertise and the best practices. It means almost invariably changing how you operate. Well, who's more likely to run into problems? The customer who made a bunch of changes and is trying really hard to apply the software, or the mm-hmm. one who isn't. Yeah. So the reality is it's not the negative experiences that are producing the longevity. It's the trying. Yes. <laughs> That's producing it because who's more likely to get results? The ones who try or the ones who don't? Obviously, right. it's customers who try right. and they're going to stub their toe and all that good stuff. So there's another contradictory piece, but actually the intuition ought to make a lot of sense. I love that. Um, one of the other uh, pieces of data that I think you've started to talk about and more of your more recent findings uh, has to do with discounting. And, and this is kind of uh, in correlation and with how customer success and onboarding and implementation teams work with sales. It, uh, tell us about why discounting uh, may be a negative thing for your business and what it's most correlated to. Yeah. So this came from an intuition that we've had, but a lot of people have had. This is not original to us, which is it seems like when you bend over backwards right. to bring a customer in who wouldn't have come in at full price, they seem to have a different attitude. They seem to have a different approach to the whole thing, right? So forget discounting. What if you said, just as an example in a sale, this is going to be super easy. 
you're not going to have to do anything different to switch on the system and benefits money right. will shower down from heaven right? right well what's that what's that customer going to behave like they're not going to behave like they need to roll up their sleeves and try really hard they're not going to re-examine how they do things right well unfortunately that's bad because that means they're not going to uh, benefit right so there are things we do in the sale that condition the way the customer approaches their onboarding and back we're back to onboarding right. this is where the rubber meets the road so what about discounting well in a way it's similar to the saying it's going to be easy what we're saying is essentially it's not that valuable it's not that important right if we could discount yeah. it 80 percent for yeah. you maybe there's not much to it we're sending a signal that devalues not just the tech by the way we think that the impact is even more important when you devalue the expertise so back to onboarding one of the things you expect when you get into onboarding is that i'm going to meet someone who's done this a hundred times or a thousand times and they kind of know what they're doing right i know my business but these guys know this thing yep. right and i better you know sharpen my pencil and pay close attention well what are we saying when we've just discounted the heck out of that thing we're saying you know you don't need to show up right. don't, don't pay too much attention don't worry about it i'm sorry but that is the signal mm -hmm. right people say no no that's not the signal Yes, it is. And here's how we know, <laughs> because the data, <coughs> pardon me, the data proves it. In the data, uh, we see consistently every time discounts start to creep up beyond like a 15, typical 15% 15 right. discount. And there's a range where it doesn't really seem to have an impact. Sure. But what we call deep discounting really does. And we've seen it in two ways. One is just measuring discounts as a share of the, of the list price. Okay. <coughs> there's a similar version of this where you look at free months as a form of discount and those mm -hmm. can be measured the same way as a percentage of the overall value right so if you're if you're discounting for three free months right you're basically giving a 25 percent discount right right so so that's one version very consistent every time we test it significant predictor of higher turn rates right so is it fair to say, obviously, there are certain sales contracts, depends on the robustness of your of your product. What I'm kind of hearing is if you get the customer to engage and, and even maybe even pay for an implementation service or pay for onboarding, have you seen that have a more positive effect on how invested they are? I'm, I'm guessing obviously <coughs> you've probably seen that happen. Yeah, totally. Back to onboarding. If you... Uh, we have every time we've tested this, and by the way, we have lots of good data on this. So we, because there's a lot of companies who've tried both. There's even companies who've tried selling um, onboarding for different prices. And so here's the interesting mm. thing: no matter what, if you charge for onboarding as a separate line item, meaning they're conscious, they're right. paying for it, you get people who are more engaged. They show up with their pencil sharp, and they pay attention, and they get better results, and they stay longer. And and it's and it's very consistent. Now, here's a question. Does it matter how much you charge for onboarding, right? Sure. Like people say, well, yeah, for sure. And, and that's right, by the way. So then I ask this question, where's the breaking point? And I, you know, we get all sorts of answers. I love to ask leadership teams. It's like, oh, it's $500 or it's $1,000. Depending on the business, some people will say it's $50,000, right? Right. <laughs> right. If right. you're SAP, it's $5 million, right? right? Whatever. Well, it turns out there is a breaking point and it's, one dollar just something that's the point that's how we know that the impact is a psychological one mm -hmm. right because if you feel like well i paid something for this i better show up and get the value for it that's the dynamic that we see fascinating the other thing we see with discounting by the way we've tested discounting from a completely different angle and this is really fun we pulled data of deals closed in the last two days of a quarter Mm. versus deals closed at any other point in the quarter. The classic discount at the end of the quarter. Right. Yeah. And we don't even know if they discounted. We just say, when were they closed? And churn is way higher for deals closed in the last two days of the, dis of the quarter. Well, that's interesting because that points to, it's not the discount itself. It's the way we sell. It's how we devalue uh, any of the elements, but particularly the expertise elements and most of those revolve around onboarding and implementation. Right. The more we do that. So people say, well, if I have to discount something, the software or the onboarding, which should I do? And we say, oh, absolutely discount the software. Sure. Because you don't want to send the signal that the things we're going to tell you aren't that important. <laughs> you don't need to do it our way. 
that's a really bad signal to send. In fact, in sales, what we want to be doing is pumping that up, talking about how valuable that expertise is, how many times we've done it, how we've worked with the most successful companies in the space, and how we've really distilled that expertise down. And if you want to do well, show up and pay attention. We're going to really give you high value expertise. Right. And what you said earlier in the show, such a critical moment, the highest leverage moment of the customer's life cycle as it comes to predictive success. Uh, it all kind of ties back to those first moments of a customer, which is- It all does. It's fascinating. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll end on this. Uh, 2023 is being declared kind of that year of customer success, the growth at all costs, specifically in, you know, in the tech sectors. Uh, you know, growth obviously is still important, but customer success teams are now in the limelight looking to improve that customer retention, improve that customer onboarding. Uh, if, if you're advising teams right now in this moment of customer success and helping them retain and upsell, uh, I, I think I know where you're going to go with this, uh, but what's that number one thing you'd say, drop all that you're doing and focus on this one area in your customer onboarding and success practices? Okay. So I'm glad you framed it that way. So I don't have to use up the trick of, I have two things. Sure. It is always in the onboarding and, and, and implementation phase that, that you have the highest leverage. So we can leave that aside. My number one is to figure out what the customer's primary objective is and measure it. Okay. And I think, well, that doesn't even include all the things we ought to do from giving them the right expertise to helping them change their behavior. But actually, it's the precondition for that. Because what we found is as long as you don't hold yourself and the customer accountable to a real metric of what they said they wanted – all sorts of things creep in. We don't have we don't have any hard edges. Everything's soft, right? So if they decide, hey, we want to go in this direction, scope creep, you're off track. Uh, well, you know that's not that important. We kind of our, our priorities shifted. You know, you you move off. Well, we couldn't do that one thing that we we knew it was really important, but you know the resources aren't there. We can't do it. Whatever happens that gets you off track is much harder to to um to happen it's much harder for that to happen if you are measuring actively the result that they want so the first thing out of the gate what's the result you guys are looking for and let's start measuring let's mm -hmm. figure out mm -hmm. once you and i call it measure and materialize once you make measuring and materializing the customer's real, result your number one kind of focus practice everything else comes out of that mm -hmm. all the other things that i would wish to see teams doing yeah will happen pretty naturally. Yeah. And, and I, you know, one of the things about uh, whether, again, you are an onboarding leader, a customer success leader, they may not know where to start. There's there's so many product usage data metrics. There's, uh, you know, revenue upsell internal goals that they have. What do you tell a, a team who, who maybe doesn't have that muscle yet? Where do they start as far as measuring results? Well, it, it's a challenge if you don't if you haven't agreed as a group on what those key results are. Sure. And one of the things that we find in our practice so consistently is that companies, if you ask them what is the primary top benefits you provide, they come up with these long lists mm. and they disagree. Yeah. Sales and marketing and even in, within CS, everyone disagrees. You've got to figure that out. We've got to nail it down. You don't provide 100 benefits. You don't even provide 10. I'm sorry, you don't. Mm -hmm. Get it down to the top one or two or at most three critical business benefits that you drive. And once you've got it down, it, it actually, the challenge of figuring out how to measure it goes away. It's, like, sure. it's not that hard. It's obvious. In many cases, the thing we most want to measure, it isn't actually measurable, right? So, we, you know, they do it to grow and we can't really measure their growth as a, you know, to really, <clears throat> fair enough. And that's actually not as big of a problem as it seems because the, 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 the fact is that many things that are important in business are hard to measure. And one of the real big value adds we bring to our clients is when we help them measure things that are hard to measure. So sometimes we're just figuring out a decent proxy, mm -hmm. right? Well, you know, I don't know, for instance, if, if, um, if I got more business out of this campaign, sure. but I know I got a lot more likes and shares on social media. Yeah. And we all know that does translate. We don't know exactly what the ratio is, but we know it translates into business. Yeah. And so we need to find good proxy measures and good shared measures. And once we do that, 
uh, honestly, everything else kind of falls out yeah. of that. Everything else becomes uh, fairly straightforward. In a separate conversation, and, and maybe if you don't mind sharing, I think you shared an example of a team who wasn't quite sure um, what to measure, but they knew you know, that overall satisfaction. Mm-hmm. I think it was a thumbs up, maybe. Yeah, yeah, tell, yeah. Me, tell me about that story. So the story there, uh, my argument is that there's no such thing as things we can't measure. There's just things we don't measure. And the sure. great example here was I had a client who – you know, I asked them what what was the main result you wanted out of this, and they said, "Well, we're trying to improve morale on a team, and we're buying this new tool to improve their you know their working experience." Mm-hmm. And I don't know how to measure that. There's really no way to measure that. I said, "Well, no, there's a way to measure it. Um, it's just a question of whether we will." So here's what I'm going to do: I'm going to call you every month, my client, and I'm going to ask you uh, to rate morale: thumbs up, thumbs sideways, or thumbs down. And you're just going to tell me that. She's like, "Yeah." Is that really Mm -hmm. like, isn't a metric something has to pop out of a system somewhere and like appear on a report? No, 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 no. We're just going to do that. We're going to see what the trend is over a year. And of course, sure enough, by the end of the year, it wasn't great to begin with and it got better and better. And we had this, I put it in a spreadsheet. That was something she could take to her boss. And you think, well, you know, is that really going to fly? Yes, because what's their alternative way to measure something? It's not that that thing isn't important. It's very important. It was an engineering team. They, they were, their uh, morale mattered a lot. And so there wasn't an alternative better way to measure it. So we just have to find ways to measure. We have to find what matters, and then we have to find ways to measure it that are better than any alternative. And you'd be amazed how consistently customers not just accept it, but really appreciate that part of it. I've actually become convinced that helping customers measure things that matter is one of the most important elements of customer bonding. It drives customer bonding almost better than anything else we do. Yeah, I love that. Well, Greg, this has been fantastic. Uh, The biggest themes I'm going to take away and that I hope the viewers and the listeners take away, find what matters, don't overcomplicate it, measure those results and do so in the highest leverage moment of the lifespan, which is during onboarding and implementation and uh, continue to measure those results throughout the life cycle will lead to a healthy customer base. Uh, Greg, we really appreciate your time. Pleasure. We would uh, love to, we will definitely link to where uh, our uh, viewers and our listeners can find you. I'm Dave, uh, co-founder of Status. You can find us at status.cx where we're helping teams shorten time to value and elevate customer experience. This has been an episode of Status Check, the customer onboarding and customer success podcast. Thank you.